get into STEM careers and STEM education uh, and to get a bit of work experience as well. Now, we'll talk about how that all looks in just a minute, especially with uh, kind of how everything is going on with COVID. Um, but uh, I would just like to encourage everybody as, as we go along, uh, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask it directly. Don't, don't uh, be shy. You can feel free to interrupt me as we go along uh, or pop it into the chat. And, uh, and as Ms. Bishop said, she will uh, ask the question as well. So don't, don't feel like you need to wait to the end. Uh, I'm happy to kind of keep this very informal uh, and feel free to kind of interject whenever uh, you would like. Uh, so I'm here to talk about the Into Science UK program, but first I thought it would be good to just give you a bit of information about me, uh, just so you can get an idea of my own background. And that's going to come in uh, fairly handy later on when we talk about uh, the type of STEM careers that are out there uh, and the type of educational opportunities that are out there uh, for anybody who wants to get into a STEM uh, field. Uh, so first I'll just say, you can probably tell from my accent, I am an American. Uh, I am from the great state of Indiana, which I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but that's this little uh, kind of purpley state here. Uh, I would say little, but honestly, it's, it's a little bit bigger. It's about the size of the UK, maybe, maybe a little bit uh, smaller, uh, but a population of only around 3 million people. It's perfectly flat. It's covered in corn. There's not a whole lot interesting about Indiana, so you don't need to go visit it, uh, except that I will say Michael Jackson is from Indiana. So we've got at least that uh, claim to fame. Uh, I studied at Purdue University, which is in Indiana and is famous for, um, or best known, I guess, for being a, a, an incredible engineering school and science school. Uh, however, I did not study engineering uh, at Purdue University. I studied uh, sociology. Now, sociology, very briefly, is just the study of how societies and cultures structure themselves to answer basically the same essential problems. Uh, all societies and cultures have to answer the same couple of questions, which is uh, kind of like, uh, how do we ensure the safety of our people? Uh, how do we administer justice uh, or punish crimes? Uh, how do we make sure that everybody is fed and educated and so on? All societies, regardless of where they are from or what period of history uh, on this planet that they, are, that they have been in, uh, have had to answer similar questions. And so the study of sociology is about how societies kind of structure themselves in answer to these questions. Uh, in addition to that, sociology is a very forward-looking study, meaning that we take uh, uh, studies and information about societies and try to come up with solutions to problems that societies might face. So oftentimes, if you see a government enacting uh, a new kind of social policy uh, or new laws that are meant to kind of curb certain behaviors, a lot of those policies stem from sociological studies. Uh, so that's what I studied at Purdue. Uh, again, they're not famous for that, but that's what I did. Uh, and when I got my sociology degree, I moved to New York City and I started working at a nonprofit uh, that was meant to help low income and hard to employ individuals. Uh, but I didn't use my sociology degree there. Uh, what I did instead while I was there is I worked on um, a computer program, which nowadays would just be an app, uh, but back then was a website uh, kind of program uh, and it helped uh, individuals kind of input their information and it would give them it would it give them um, all the possible kind of income supports government supports um, uh, food supports uh, educational supports and so on that they would qualify for and then that application that I built um, would pre-populate their applications for these various uh, governmental supports or non-governmental supports in some cases and then it would send it off for them uh, automatically so that individual uh, did not have to do anything to ensure that they got their benefits. Uh, from there, uh, I decided to leave the nonprofit sector. And uh, one nice thing about studying at an American university, which is not necessarily true uh, here in the UK, is when you are studying sociology, for example, like I was doing, you can also study uh, basically anything else uh, that you have the time for or that you're interested in. And so as a sort of side project, uh, while I was at Purdue, I studied mathematics. Uh, and when I decided to leave my job in New York, I took a few exams to uh, pass the education board and to prove that I knew my maths. Uh, and I became a mathematics teacher. Uh, and I taught mathematics for about seven or eight years. Um, and I taught all over the world. So I moved from New York City to Oakland, California, which is just across the bay from San Francisco. Uh, and then I moved to Casablanca, Morocco, 
Uh, and then I came here to London and I taught at Burlington Danes Academy, uh, which is in White City. Uh, so I've taught in London schools as well. Uh, and then after a little bit of time doing all of that, uh, I decided that I wanted to go back into charity work or nonprofit work. Uh, and I got myself um, uh, into a program, running a program uh, called the Breathe Magic Intensive Therapy Program. And what Breathe Magic did was it took uh, young people with a disability called hemiplegia, uh, which is a paralysis or weakness of one side of the body. It's typically uh, vertically, and it usually affects one side more than the other. If you know anybody in your life, who an adult who may have suffered a stroke, um, they typically lose control over the left side of their body, for example. It's very similar for young people, uh, and childhood stroke is one way that they can come about uh, getting hemiplegia, but it comes from uh, many different avenues, in fact, and often stems from brain damage. Uh, so if you, you have brain damage in one side, at one hemisphere of their brain, it'll affect the opposite side of their body. And what uh, Breathe uh, Arts Health Research did was we developed a physical therapy program using close-up magic tricks to help young people regain, or in some instances gain for the very first time, of movement in their affected hands. Uh, so this uh, picture of this little boy here, his name is Ben. Uh, when he came on our program, he was seven years old, and this hand that he's holding up here, um, he had never been able to open in his entire life. He grew up with it uh, balled up in a fist. And then he came onto our program, uh, which was a physical therapy program, and over two weeks of intensive therapy and learning some magic tricks, he was able uh, to fully extend uh, his hand all the way open. And not only that, ex fully extend each individual finger um, uh, uh, by itself, which is something that's uh, more difficult than you might imagine, especially if you've never had uh, this particular disability before. And this picture is of him performing a magic trick uh, on a stage in front of 300 people, and he's about eight years old, I think, in this photo. Um, so I tell you all of that uh, just to kind of explain uh, that I come from a STEM background, uh, and but I have done so many different things that had um, uh, slight, uh, if not any, uh, resemblance to the actual education that I received at university. So I got a STEM degree, sociology is a part of the STEM field, uh, but I didn't do uh, what most sociologists would do, which is stay in academia, uh, and do reports, uh, and write, uh, and kind of do all these studies on people and places. I did other things with my education. And that's kind of what I'm here to talk about and what my program uh, Into Science UK is all about. Uh, so first, before I move on, let's just have a quick chat about what STEM is. Um, is there a brave soul out there? I can't actually see you. Um, but is there a brave soul out there who would like to unmute themselves and take a stab at what STEM means? Or you can pop it in the chat and maybe Ms. Bishop will read to me who, who got to it first. Science, technology, engineering, and maths. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, so, yes, yeah, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and maths. And oftentimes when people think of STEM, uh, they probably think of kind of the big four, uh, which is maths, uh, chemistry, physics, and biology. But I'm here to tell you that STEM is actually a much broader field uh, than you might even uh, imagine. Uh, it encompasses a whole host of uh, possible subjects to study and possible subjects to eventually get a career in. I've just put up another, I don't know, roughly 50 other subjects that are under the STEM umbrella. But even this is only really the tip of the iceberg uh, for things that are out there for you to be doing with a STEM degree and in STEM education. Uh, so just to give you uh, kind of a, a, a few examples of this, I've thrown up a couple of pictures of uh, possible careers in the STEM field uh, that you may not uh, automatically think about when thinking of a STEM career. Uh, so this lady here in the top left on the computer, uh, I put her in here to represent uh, what we would call ethical hackers. Um, so you have all probably heard of hackers before. These are people who uh, break into uh, computer systems of big banks, of governments, oftentimes actually of corporations to try and steal uh, patents and steal designs uh, that those corporations hold. Uh, and then they turn around, they try to sell them to other people. What an ethical hacker does is they are hired by corporations or governments uh, to test the, the security of their system. So an ethical hacker will sit down and actually purposely try to break into uh, the FBI's database, for example, or might break into uh, Coca-Cola's computer systems to try to steal the magical formula to make Coca-Cola. 
uh, and they are hired to find weaknesses in those systems, and then those, and then when they've identified those, then the, the organization can go back in and patch those areas of weakness uh, to make themselves more secure and to prevent uh, malicious hacking in the future. Uh, this here is a concept model um, uh, of a BMW uh, kind of futuristic design of a uh, transport uh, in the future. Uh, so one of the growing fields of STEM uh, is, is in uh, ecological design uh, and uh, automotive design, transport design, to help kind of uh, battle uh, uh, many different problems in our society like uh, congestion on the roads, uh, pollution stemming from vehicles uh, being mostly at the moment uh, petrol-based uh, uh, automotive designs and moving over to electrical designs. Uh, and if they are going to be electrical, they need to be a bit more efficient so that our batteries don't have to be as big, um, uh, so that the car is not majority battery, basically. In the old days, when they first started making electric cars, the battery took up like 70% of the weight of the car. Uh, and they didn't have enough space to put any more seats in or a trunk uh, for you to put your luggage in or anything like that. Uh, so these are um, is a, a kind of a growing field uh, that people with STEM backgrounds are getting into. I put these scuba divers in here. These are marine biologists. And what these two uh, in particular are doing um, are studying coral reefs. And with uh, global warming and climate change, the acidity of the ocean is starting to rise. Uh, and as the acidity of the ocean rises, coral reefs uh, die off. And if we lose our coral reefs, then we lose um, a habitat for a diverse range of species uh, in the ocean. So what these guys are doing are actually uh, diving in down. They're taking samples of these coral reefs to study this sort of die off uh, and to figure out how they may prevent it or to promote new growth uh, in these coral reefs. I uh, put this Legoland uh, picture in here because one thing, uh, obviously everybody probably thought of engineering uh, when you saw the word STEM because that's what the E stands for. But when you think of engineering, you think of people who build bridges or people who uh, build skyscrapers. Uh, but actually, uh, you need engineers to help build Lego models and Lego statues, like in this case at Legoland. Uh, but even just the little Lego models of uh, little police cars or dinosaurs or what have you, um, my son's got a billion Legos in his box uh, upstairs. Each and every single piece of those of those Lego blocks uh, and the ultimate designs that they go into were designed by somebody with an engineering background. Uh, so if you don't want to spend your time building bridges, you could spend your time designing uh, Lego toys for young people to enjoy uh, in the future. There's, of course, aviation, which I've got these two pilots here in this uh, corner here. Uh, but it's not just the pilots, it's all the technology that goes into making an airplane fly, and not just making it fly, but making sure it ends up where it was supposed to go in the end. Uh, so all that computer technology that go in, goes into making sure that it's flying straight and flying true, uh, all the technology and radars that go into it to make sure that they're not uh, going to be bumping up against other objects that are in the sky with them, uh, including the communication devices they use uh, to communicate with ground control, uh, about where they should be flying and the proper um, elevations they should be in and so on. Loads of science and technology that goes into just simply making a plane uh, fly and take somebody off to holiday somewhere. And then this last person I want to put in here, this scientist who's look who looks like she's working with these uh, kind of bits of tomato. Um, one of a huge growing areas of STEM uh, are what we call food scientists. Um, uh, I'll go back to global warming, which is a kind of uh, one of my uh, kind of huge examples because it impacts every single bit of our society. Um, global warming and overpopulation are impacting our food chains. Uh, so we are losing uh, space uh, to farm the kind of um, uh, fruits and vegetables that we need uh, in order to supply the, in our grocery store. But also we're running out of space that we can use for uh, cattle or uh, pork or chickens or anything that really that you might eat uh, that's in the grocery store today uh, are becoming more and more difficult to uh, create or to manufacture. And so one solution to this problem uh, is uh, food science, where we are actually synthetically creating food in a laboratory. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, one uh, uh, recent example is we are now able to kind of grow a steak uh, in a Petri dish uh, in a lab. And so you no longer need uh, hundreds of heads of cattle 
in order to make uh, a certain uh, amount of steak that we would put in our stores, we can actually begin to grow it. And we can grow it from steak cells. Uh, so it will taste like steak, it'll smell like steak, it'll look like steak, uh, but it will be entirely grown in a laboratory. Uh, my favorite example, if I'm to give you another one, is uh, we are now working on uh, uh, creating synthetic coffee, uh, a purely chemical, uh, and partly the reason for that is because of global warming, the areas in which we can grow coffee beans are starting to shrink, which raises the price of coffee, which makes coffee more scarce, uh, and so on. And obviously, uh, coffee is something that if, uh, most adults, especially myself, uh, we like to drink in order to make sure that we're staying awake and that we can uh, do our jobs, but also raise our children and so on. Uh, and in the future, the coffee that we might be drinking from cafes uh, is going to be purely synthetic, meaning it'll taste like coffee, it'll look like coffee, it'll smell like coffee, it'll give you the same caffeine kick as coffee, but it will not have been created from a coffee bean. Uh, and so science, uh, or food science in particular, is a huge growing field um, that's kind of helping to solve a particular societal problem uh, caused by global warming and overpopulation. Uh, this picture here, uh, if we were in person, I would ask uh, for anybody to tell me if they, well, actually, we can do this anyway. Uh, if you put in the chat, what do you think you are looking at right here um, uh, in this kind of uh, computer screen? Anybody want to take any guess? Actually, uh, at the it looks like animation. I'm sorry, sorry say, it again? Wait, say it again. It looks like some sort of animation. That's what my guess is. Yeah, actually, that's that's exactly right. This is uh, a computer program that helps uh, that is used to design animated movies. And this particular one you're looking at is actually from Finding Dory. Uh, so you can see here that what you're looking at with these kind of blocks and these 3D spaces and so on, all of these represent these sort of like sunlight ripples that you'll see uh, in this image here of Dory uh, and how they make the water look realistic, but also how they make Dory's uh, uh, travel through a 3D space or the 3D ocean appear to be 3D as opposed to just a 2D her going left and right across the screen. Uh, they use this uh, kind of animation um, uh, platform to help it make it make Dory look like she's swimming in an open ocean uh, and has all the abilities to move in sort of a 3D space. And this little um, uh, kind of image down here with the colorful arrows is Dory herself. Uh, and so it goes from looking like that in the background of a computer program to looking like this when it comes to our cinemas. Uh, and this is also true of a lot of the movies that we watch nowadays. Here's the Avengers, uh, here's the actor uh, wearing his kind of tech suit. And then later, after they film these sort of scenes, they'll go back through in CGI and they will uh, layer over the actor's face to give him uh, the kind of, um, you know, the sort of like alien-like aspects uh, of his face and also all the cool features of his costume and so on, and almost entirely done uh, through computer graphics and through programs like this. So yet another area of STEM. Uh, I'm just going to pause here, just because I know uh, Joanne, you had um, you sounded like you were going to ask a question or say something earlier. So I'm just going to pause and see if there's anything that I can uh, answer first. Yeah, cool. So yeah, it's all really, really interesting stuff. But um, actually, Amina just um, asked when you were talking about the kind of the you know growing steaks and growing coffee. How <laughs> you did make a comment about how how healthy are these though? Well, that's something I uh, don't actually know enough about, uh, to be honest with you. So I can't give you a straight answer on that. But I guarantee you, you can go look up synthetic meat. Go Google it after this. Don't do it now because I'd like you to pay attention to me. Uh, but afterwards, go ahead and Google synthetic meat, um, and you will find uh, a whole host of information on it. Um, my guess would be is that it's going to be roughly equivalent health-wise, at least for the, the meat, uh, because they grow it from meat tissues. Uh, meaning that it is, it is by all intents and purposes, meat. It's not synthetically made uh, through chemicals and whatnot. Uh, it's um, a steak tissue that they then layer on top of each other. And I think they can even use a 3D printer uh, to actually print uh, a steak out. So they would get tissue from a filet mignon, for example, and then they would print a new filet mignon from that. Uh, so it ought to taste like its original self. And what I would imagine is it will be just as healthy 
uh, if not healthier in some instances, because they can actually remove layers of fat and so on uh, as they're building it. But don't take my word for it. Definitely go look that up uh, after this. The coffee one, I have no idea, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a diehard coffee drinker. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for me to, to uh, transfer over into drinking synthetic coffee if it isn't exactly like uh, what coffee tastes like now, because I'm going to be just, it's, it's going to hurt me internally and in my soul. I, uh, any other questions before I move on? No, no. I mean, I, I think um, what Zara was just said is that is that like the thing where they get an empty cell and grow stuff in it? I mean, I think you've basically stimulated a lot of thought here, and I think there'll be a lot of googling when you finish. So, <laughs> I think if you if you carry on, and I'll let you know if anything else comes up. Great, that's perfect. That's that's the whole point. Is I want to get people out of the idea that STEM is strictly. Uh, like stuck in a laboratory with a lab coat on. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Some people love to do that kind of stuff. There's groundbreaking research that's happening inside of labs. Um, but there are, um, I want people to kind of expand the horizons about what STEM really means. Uh, oftentimes I'll ask people, can you name a STEM profession? And they'll say, oh yeah, doctors, right? Well, of course doctors are in the STEM field. They fall under that umbrella. But I don't want you to think that's the only thing that, that is available to you by going down the STEM uh, path of education or career. In fact, that's what this next slide is all about, is about various uh, sectors of careers that you can get into with a STEM background. And I'm just going to highlight a few of them. I'm not going to show, I'm not going to talk about each one of them, but I want to talk about a few of them that probably you weren't thinking about uh, when you first signed up to come to this presentation. So I'll start with this public health one in the top left corner. All of you are probably aware of the campaign, the governmental campaign of at least five a day, right? Well, that was because uh, a scientist somewhere said, uh, sat down and tried to figure out how much uh, fruit and vegetables we need in our diet to maintain a healthy diet. And then how many, you know, fat, saturated fats and how many salts and sugars and things that we should try to restrict out of our diet. Now, I want to point out real quick here um, that uh, public health is a governmental sector. Uh, and so often, so this thing that you're looking at at least five a day, uh, somebody in the government came up with that slogan and came up with that kind of campaign to push out to the general population. Uh, if you want to know the real truth, though, uh, scientists actually think that it should be something closer to 20 a day. Uh, but they didn't think that 20 a day was going to be an easy sell uh, to the general population. If you said you need to eat 20 vegetables and fruit a day, uh, they just figured nobody would bother. Uh, so they shortened the, the total number from 20 to five, but they raised uh, the, the number of servings that each one would count for. Uh, so it's not actually five a day, it's technically 20, but it depends on uh, how, how much uh, vegetables and fruit you're getting at each serving, if that makes sense. Uh, so just something to think about, public health is a governmental sector, uh, but requires the expertise of scientists in order to make uh, public health choices and campaigns for the general population. I'm also gonna highlight uh, journalism here. Uh, I know that with journalism, uh, probably a lot of you think, oh, well, I need to have an English background or a literature background, uh, and that's not necessarily true. In fact, for science journals, like the New Scientists or National Geographic uh, and things like that, you um, actually is much more helpful to have a science background because you need to know about what you're talking about, or at least have some understanding of how the science behind the breakthrough uh, or behind the study works in order to write about it in an intelligent way. Uh, so oftentimes, uh, uh, people who work in a, at a science magazine or a science journal, um, they might have some uh, writing or literature background, but their main background is actually a science background. And if you understand how science works in chemistry or physics or biology, uh, then you are going to be well prepared to deal with uh, almost any type of science because they follow obviously the same uh, structure of hypothesis and testing and then revising and so on. Uh, so journalism is an area that if you have a STEM degree, you can get into. Uh, I will just highlight here mobile app and software developers. Um, there is a growing uh, push for people who develop uh, app, apps and uh, software um, not to just make games or to uh, track uh, your health, which it, which it does do, your phone does that now, and tells you how many steps you've taken and so on and so forth. Uh, but people are also using this power uh, to help uh, low-income communities, impoverished communities all around the world, 
um, uh, get access to clean water, get access to uh, the internet, get access to uh, uh, health testing services, if, especially if they live in remote locations and they can't go see a doctor. There are people out there right now developing applications and software to help people, uh, even in remote locations, get access to health care. Uh, so it's a growing field as well. So if you're trying to get into a field where you can feel good about the work that you do and make an impact on, on the planet or in people's lives, uh, you can do that in a lot of different ways. Uh, with a STEM background. Uh, my favorite one here is politicians, think tanks, and NGOs, uh, because I know when most of you see your politicians, you probably don't think that that person uh, has a science background. And most, to be fair, most of them don't. Although I think um, uh, uh, Angela Merkel, Merkel, the uh, chancellor of Germany, I believe she is a physicist. Uh, I might be wrong about exactly what science she's in, uh, but I think she's a trained physicist uh, or something like that. Um, so there are uh, politicians and so on who come from scientific backgrounds, but more importantly, uh, our politicians rely on uh, people within their uh, office or within their organization with scientific backgrounds to give them good, sound scientific advice. And you're going to see that, that um, probably most, um, most often nowadays with, with the way everything is going uh, with coronavirus. Um, uh, we can assume that our leaders don't know anything about coronavirus or they know uh, basically just as much as you and I probably know uh, about it because they don't come from science backgrounds, but they are leaning on uh, experts and scientists in the field to give them the best advice based off of current research uh, around coronavirus, around immunizations, around how to protect ourselves, and so on. Uh, so these, again, are just a few sectors I wanted to point out um, just to show you that uh, a STEM field um, is not strict, strictly, you know, kind of restricted to a laboratory work or to being a doctor or, or so on. There are loads of other areas that you can get into that might have to do with the medical field or they might help with uh, someone get health care, but it doesn't mean that you're actually a doctor or anything like that. It doesn't mean if you're an engineer that you have to build bridges. Uh, you can see this picture at the bottom. You can build 3D printed um, uh, uh, legs and arms for amputees, for example. So lots of things to get into, lots of things to think about. Um, and we can talk about a little bit more of those a little bit uh, further down the line. Now, uh, you've heard a lot, you've heard me talk a lot about uh, kind of the STEM fields, about what STEM education opens up to you. Uh, I want to talk about why Into Science UK exists um, and to kind of first define what the problem is. Uh, so the problem, of course, is that the UK in general has an annual shortfall of about 40,000 STEM workers a year. So that's annual, uh, which means that that compounds every year. So if you have a shortfall of 40,000 jobs from uh, 2019 that did not get filled, those carry over into 2020, and then you have an additional shortfall after that. Uh, so that actually expands. So I think this data, a shortfall of 40,000 STEM workers comes from 2017, maybe 2018. Uh, so that shortfall is actually much bigger uh, than it even was when I first wrote uh, this particular slide. Uh, what that means is, is that we have a largely scientifically illiterate society. Uh, and what I mean by that is there are a lot of people who don't understand the science behind uh, some of the things that they see in this world. This is why you have, and I'll, I'll say, to be honest, <laughs> if we're going to be perfectly blunt, it probably happens more in my country than it does um, uh, here, but it does happen here and it does happen around the rest of the world. Uh, but this is why we still, at least in America, for example, still have debates about whether global warming is real. And that's because people don't understand how science works, uh, and they don't understand the numbers that they're looking at, uh, and they don't understand the, the kind of language behind science that would help them kind of grasp the sheer scale of what, what we're talking about when we talk about climate change and global warming. And in addition, there's uh, people out there who don't believe that coronavirus is real or that it's not as deadly as, it, as, as they say it is or that you shouldn't have to wear a mask, right? These are byproducts of a society that, do, that does not understand science as much as they should. Uh, but we are a society that uses science all the time. Uh, you use a phone, you use a computer, you're talking to me right now on a virtual platform that goes over uh, the internet uh, off of satellites and bouncing back to the earth and so on. And all of this is huge scientific advances uh, over just the last 20 years or so that we don't really actually understand how they properly function. 
And so one of the reasons that Into Science UK exists is to kind of promote science and to make sure that people understand uh, how it's applied in your daily life. Uh, and the last one, and probably the biggest reason why this program exists, is that there is poor social mobility uh, within scientific uh, studies and within professions. Uh, in particular, uh, the, the example I often use is if I said the word engineer to you, uh, who is the first person that pops into your mind when you envision an engineer? And I would imagine for most of you, uh, you probably envisioned a white male in a, you know, in a vest, in a, one of those high-vis vests and a hard hat, you know, because that's what our image of an engineer is or stereotypically is. Uh, the same thing could be said about doctors, although I think that has actually kind of changed over the last 10 years. But if you had asked my generation when we were in school to envision a doctor inside your head, they would have almost always been white male doctors. Uh, probably from upper class backgrounds, probably went to the best schools, uh, and so on. And so this creates a barrier uh, to people accessing scientific uh, professions and scientific education. And particularly if you don't know anybody in your family who uh, is in a scientific field that you wish to study or that went to a prestigious university or so on, then it's harder for you to find uh, information that you might need about how to go about uh, getting into this profession or how to go about approaching this education uh, field and so on. And so that's kind of what we're here for. Uh, and so we kind of provide a sort of solution to this. Um, but I want to just talk about if you go into the STEM profession, uh, STEM graduates have several advantages compared to uh, any other educational field that you might want to get into. One, their skills are extremely high in demand. As I said earlier, there's a shortfall every year of about 40,000 jobs in the STEM field, which means that if you come from a STEM background, people are going to be throwing themselves at you to hire you because there's just simply not enough people. I actually experienced this when I became a math teacher. Uh, math teachers and science teachers are the two rarest teachers uh, out there. Uh, so they're difficult to find uh, just in sheer number, but it's also difficult to find quality uh, maths and science teachers. So when I became a math teacher, uh, all of a sudden, I had uh, unsolicited emails from all over the world of people offering me a job at their school in Dubai or at their school uh, in, uh, in Australia or at their school in uh, Mogadishu. And the reason for that was because there were so few math teachers out there, they, they, they were literally asking anybody with a math degree uh, to come and educate their young people. Same with a science degree and so on. Uh, so you're extremely high in demand. Uh, because of that, uh, when you're high in demand, you get a higher salary. And uh, people with STEM backgrounds typically have a 20% higher salary uh, than other professions. What you can also do with this, as I kind of mentioned earlier, I've, allu I've alluded to many times throughout this presentation, is you get a chance to directly impact society to make a positive lasting change. So you don't have to be stuck in a laboratory making the next doomsday device. You could be in a laboratory inventing the, the solution to our plastic problem uh, or uh, coming up with an innovative solution that helps um, uh, lower cancer rates and so on. So there's a lot of ways to make a positive impact uh, on this planet and for many people around the world um, and huge groups of people. It's not just helping five or six people uh, here and there. It's helping millions of people in one go through one innovation. Uh, in addition, uh, people who work in STEM backgrounds typically have greater job satisfaction, partly because uh, I think uh, the field can be so niche that you can, if you have a STEM background, you can really go out and find a job that suits you perfectly. And because they're so in demand, because there's so many jobs available, because they pay uh, higher than most other careers, um, they, typically people who are in STEM backgrounds love their jobs. Uh, and because of all of these kind of things that I've already said before, the uh, uh, ability to impact um, uh, other people's lives, the ability to make real change uh, and so on means that they just love their jobs more than people who don't have STEM backgrounds. Uh, there are also, as I said, more opportunities because STEM is one of the fastest growing sectors. So all of these things that I said are all true and, and they, they kind of go into this other bit about just having more options out there. Uh, you also have, as I've said already, uh, more flexibility in choosing the job that you would like. So you can get into a, a job in a STEM field 
and go, no, I don't really think that's for me. But if you have, say, a chemistry background, there will be loads of different uh, opportunities to apply that chemistry background um, and that you can kind of keep you know, testing different careers out and different pathways out until you find the thing that works for you. Uh, so you just have a more variety to choose from. Now, uh, part of our program is obviously about STEM education and STEM careers, but we want to talk about year post year 13 career pathways, because I know you guys are in year 12. I think most of you are probably in year 12 anyway, and this program is designed for year 12 students. Uh, but what we, we try to do is give you information about what happens next. So after you're done with sixth form and you're looking to go to university, uh, what are the different pathways to get into uh, to kind of get into the STEM career of your dreams, right? Well, one pathway is apprenticeships. Uh, we will talk a lot about universities and we will talk a lot about apprenticeships because we at Into Science UK don't believe that there's one correct answer. So we don't believe that everyone must go to university. Uh, and in fact, for some careers, there are better options than university and those kind of come in the way of apprenticeships. So first of all, uh, apprenticeships are a great alternative to start your career path. You can typically, uh, depending on the type of apprenticeship, you can get paid, um, you can have a job while working on your qualification and your degree at the same time. Uh, one prime example of this is Dyson, the, those guys who make the vacuums. Um, Dyson has an, an, an engineering apprenticeship program where uh, they house you, you live on a, like their Dyson campus, you get your own uh, a flat, um, they pay you uh, because you're an employee, uh, you have a job, so you start working at Dyson straight away, and while you're working there, you'll get trained in, your, in an engineering degree uh, at the same time. Uh, so that's just one example, there are literally hundreds of them out there, and on our program, we'll try to give you as much information about apprenticeships as we can. Uh, but just be aware that you can get paid uh, while getting your qualification or degree, and that's kind of the advantage of an apprenticeship. Apprenticeships are also available to anyone over the age of 16. So pretty much all of you right now on this uh, presentation, uh, there are apprenticeships out there. Uh, many of them, when you're this young, are going to be unpaid, but opportunities for you to kind of start getting your foot in the door. Uh, and they are at many different levels, uh, but they're available to pretty much anybody starting at the age of 16 and beyond. Oftentimes are paid, which I pretty much hammered, and I'll just keep hammering. You can get paid for them. Um, and they, we have many workshops on the types of apprenticeships that are available to you and to see if they are the right option for you. Uh, I'll just give you a few helpful tips because uh, even if you don't decide to apply to our program, uh, I always uh, kind of feel like you should leave this presentation with some information that you find useful, even if you decide you don't want to join into science at the end. Uh, so one thing I'll tell you about um, apprenticeships is you can go to find an apprenticeship, which is on uh, the government website. You can literally just Google find an apprenticeship uh, gov.uk and that'll bring up the website. They'll give you, you can set up an account, it's free, uh, and they'll give you loads of information about the types of apprenticeships that are out there, uh, what qualifications you might need in order to apply for them. Uh, and oftentimes uh, uh, employers who offer apprenticeships We'll post them up directly on that website. So you can actually go and see the type of apprenticeships that are available to you. And you can do that right now. You don't have to join into Science UK to do that. Um, just a bit of helpful advice. The UCAS website as well has some helpful resources. Um, I'll send this link uh, over to Ms. Bishop at the end of this so she can just kind of forward them on to everybody afterwards. Uh, but you can just uh, go to Understanding Apprenticeships at UCAS, and they have loads of information about how to get into it, what you might want to do, what type of apprenticeships to aim for, and so on. Uh, and you can also find an apprenticeship that suits your level. Uh, so there are these different types of apprenticeships. Uh, they have different names, intermediate, level two, advanced, level three, and so on. And these are the equivalent educational level that you can get from them. Uh, so there are, as I said before, apprenticeships that uh, are at level six and seven that you basically, when you are done uh, doing your job and getting, and getting um, the training on the job, you will have an equivalent of a master's or a bachelor's degree uh, at the end of that, all while you've been working. Uh, so just something to think about. Uh, if you come on to Into Science UK, we will do workshops specifically about apprenticeships. We have uh, people who run apprenticeship programs who will come to us uh, and they will do workshops about uh, what you can do with them and how to apply and so on. Dyson is actually one of them, uh, so it's why I use them as an example, but there are loads. BMW has one, Mercedes has one, 
Um, I think the government, uh, uh, your guys' Department of Defense has one, a Ministry of Defense, I'm sorry, I forget you guys call it different names. Um, so just be aware, there are loads out there, and on our program, we'll try to give you as much information about apprenticeships as possible. Uh, but there are also, of course, is university pathways. Um, for some jobs, you need a degree. Um, it, oftentimes, if you have a university degree, you have better career prospects. Uh, and because you have better career prospects, you have a higher earning potential as far as the amount of money you can make in a future career. Uh, this is oftentimes why schools and why your parents and uh, pretty much anybody says, go get a university degree, because it is true that you can make more money uh, in certain, with certain degrees uh, and you can get a better job and so on. That is a true statement. Um, you also get transferable skills. I'll take you back to how I introduced myself at the start. I studied sociology at an engineering school. Uh, but I did uh, uh, so many different types of jobs and different career paths that I took um, that that I did not expect when I was younger, um, that I did not expect to do when I was when I was your age, um, that I uh, thoroughly enjoyed doing, that I loved having the experience of having done. Um, but it was because I did a STEM degree that opened the door for me uh, to kind of explore those options. And so you've got transferable skills and you can draw on skills and knowledge from different fields. Uh, so I did sociology, but I worked uh, like basically making a, 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 an application or a, a, a computer software at a nonprofit. I taught maths, but then I also worked at a physical therapy uh, charity, which is basically occupational therapy. Uh, so all those skills and knowledge from different fields came together for me uh, along my career path. And that's true of, of, of anything that you guys are going to be doing in the future as well. Uh, as I said, if you don't want to join into Science UK, that's totally fine. I'll give you some helpful tips anyway. Uh, when you are looking to apply for university, one thing I would say is study something you actually enjoy. Uh, one of the biggest pitfalls that young people get into is they uh, think that um, oh, being a doctor means I get more money and more respect, and so I'm just going to be a doctor. Or my parents say I should be a doctor. Or uh, everybody in my family is a doctor, so I'm going to be one, right? Well. Don't choose your path of study uh, just based off of that. Choose something that you are going to enjoy. It'll make a massive difference about your happiness in your life later on and in your career uh, if you are studying something and working at somewhere uh, that you love. Uh, it makes a huge difference. I can't stress this enough. I know a lot of you probably haven't had jobs yet, but there is nothing worse than being in a job that you cannot stand because a job takes up eight hours of your day, Monday through Friday, and if you're in a place that you just cannot stand, you're not going to be happy, even if everything else in your life is great, all right? So just something to be aware of. I would also remind people to check the competitiveness of certain, universities deg uh, certain university degrees and uh, any bursary and alternative offerings they may have. Now, I'm just gonna break away from the slide just for a second to show you what I'm talking about. Uh, there is this link here that I'll pop uh, into the chat here in a second. Don't know why this is up. Uh, but there is a website called Admissions Report, okay? And on here, you can actually look up universities you may be interested in attending. And what's interesting uh, about this website and what is going to be beneficial for you as you're thinking about the universities you want to attend uh, is there are some degrees that are super competitive. So I've chosen Oxford here as my example. Uh, but you can look up Cambridge, you can look up UCL. Uh, I think they're all in here. Uh, and you can see here, if you scroll down, these are the most competitive um, uh, programs or degree fields of study at Oxford University and the percentages of, P of applications of people who get accepted. So for example, mathematics and statistics um, is the most competitive field to get into at Oxford. They accept almost just under 6% of total applications uh, on their mathematics and statistics programs, all right? So if that's something you have your heart set on, please be aware that only 6% of people get in there. But if you looked further on the, if you look to the right on the least competitive courses, if your goal is strictly to get into Oxford and you have a little bit of flexibility of what you wanna study, there are ways to get into Oxford or easier ways to get into Oxford um, than applying for these more competitive programs. Uh, so one thing I wanna point out here is medicine, Medicine's gonna be high up on the competitive scale for almost any university you go into. However, if you look at something down here, least competitive, and you look at chemistry, for example, you can get into the medical field having studied chemistry. It may not be a doctor, I don't really know. There's probably different pathways to do it, 
Uh, but you can see here that at Oxford University, they accepted 35% uh, of uh, chemistry applicants versus 9.5% uh, of medicine applicants. So just something to be aware of while you're applying for university, uh, go to admissionsreport.com and check what their most competitive ones are versus their least competitive. Now, these are based off percentages of acceptances. If you scroll a bit further down, you can just see the sheer number of applications for each one. So uh, philosophy, politics, and economics have the most, 2,338 applicants last year or on a yearly basis or an average. Uh, but then if you look over here, classics and English, 40 applicants, right? Across the whole of the UK for that one field of study. Now that's not STEM, uh, obviously, but it's just something I want you to be aware of. Uh, here's uh, physiological sciences, right? So if you wanna talk about a STEM subject, 95 applicants last year uh, versus physics, 1,405 applicants. So the competitiveness of the degree field that you're trying to get into makes a massive difference about whether you get into a university of your choosing or not. So have a real think about those and see if there's anything in these least competitive column that you are interested in doing uh, that you would be willing to do or willing to study uh, in the future. It's going to make a huge impact on your applications later on. Now I'm just going to go back here real quick. Uh, I'll just pause here while I'm waiting for this to load. Are there any questions, any comments before I move on to the next bit? Nothing at the moment, I don't think. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Hey, if you guys got anything, feel free to shout them out. It's, no, it's not a problem. Oh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, not just the competitiveness of, of degrees, but check university websites for whether they have a bursary option of financial support, because they oftentimes do. And there might be um, some thresholds uh, that you might already meet. And so when you're applying for universities, it might be good to just take a look at those bursary options uh, if, if your economic circumstances are such that you're not going to apply to a school because you're afraid you won't be able to afford it. So double check those financial uh, supports that that university may offer and alternative offerings. So I'm gonna pop out again, which I shouldn't have done, I suppose, or I should not come back here, I guess. Um, one example I've got up here is called Pathways to Birmingham. Now, this is for Birmingham University, but a lot of these universities have uh, similar things where if you join the Pathways to Birmingham um, uh, program, and there'll be some criteria to it, and you'll have to apply and so on, but if you get accepted onto it, they may be, if you complete the program, they may be willing to accept lower grades uh, than what their standard offer would be. And so I believe on this page, the reason I pulled it up is because they show it. Yes, so here you can see if you wanted to get into medicine uh, at Birmingham University uh, and you went through their pathways offer, you could technically get in with an ABB uh, as opposed to AAA, right? So look for uh, programs for alternative offerings at universities. Uh, that's going to give you kind of a leg up as well on trying to get into you know, some of these more competitive places or to try to get into the degree that you want, but maybe you don't quite have the grades for it and so on, uh, these are places to look into as well. All right, so I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna breeze through a few other things real quick here, uh, and then we'll just get into kind of what the Into Science UK program offers you. Let's see here, just um, wanna hammer home just a few more things though. Uh, explore all the possible options. It's okay, completely okay, not to know exactly what you wanna do with your life yet. Uh, when I was your age, I had no idea. I didn't even get into my kind of future career or profession until I was about 23, 24. Uh, and even then, uh, you saw from my kind of opening, I changed careers four times uh, already, uh, and I have loved every minute of it, okay? So you don't need to know exactly what you wanna be doing with your life right now. It is completely normal not to know. Uh, so don't feel like, oh, I must know right now. Take your time, explore all your possible options. Uh, and the last one is I will suggest to everybody, if you want to kind of develop your confidence and independence and taking steps toward your preferred career choice, you can start doing that now. And a couple ways to do that are doing extra reading or online lectures. Uh, and there's also, um, you should look to try to find a mentor that's already in the field um, of study or career that you wanna be in, who can give you a little help and guidance in a one-to-one -one setting, which I think is a perfect segue uh, into what our program does. So obviously you guys are probably aware that what makes a successful application to a university are a couple of things. Uh, good A-level grades, work experience and role models, 
and careers advice and university application support. People that you can lean on to make sure that you're writing good personal statements and so on. And that's exactly what Into Science UK does. Uh, we provide real world STEM work placements and role models. Now, because of COVID, uh, our in-person placements are, we're still aiming to kind of have them go ahead this summer, but to be honest, we don't really know what, that, what the summer looks like just yet. I'm sure everybody's probably aware of that, um, but that's typically how we would like to operate our program. Uh, so this year we're running it in a sort of hybrid virtual uh, and in-person scheme. Uh, so we have loads of virtual opportunities on an online platform that we developed. Uh, but at the same time, if it's possible to have in-person experiences in a lab uh, uh, with um, somebody who works in a organization or a pharmaceutical company, for example, that you want to work in, uh, if first, if in-person placements are allowed, we will do our best to place people uh, in in-person placements. So you actually get to go into these organizations and get a real life experience um, of what working in that place or working in that field is like. In addition to that, we offer bespoke skills days and workshops, and I'll give you a few examples in just a minute. And we also offer university admissions guidance uh, and support. Um, so let's briefly talk about the first bit of that, which are kind of the first two bits of that, which are sort of the bespoke lectures and the kind of work experience slash placements that you can get. Um, what I'm putting up right now are examples of what we ran last year. And last year's program was entirely virtual. So nothing was in person because obviously uh, coronavirus had kind of caused chaos all around the world. We still ran our program and we ran it on a virtual platform. And here's a few examples of what we did. Um, we had uh, a lecturer come in and give a lecture on engineering the immune system to target cancer. Uh, this was a doctor from the University of Kent uh, who gave this lecture, uh, one of the most popular lectures that we gave last year for young people who are interested in biochemistry. Uh, you might be interested in computer science. One example of what we did last year was uh, something called adversarial machine learning. Uh, and this was run uh, by um, uh, Dr. Zizo, who is at the Security Science and Technology uh, School uh, at Imperial College. Uh, we also did, um, this is one of my favorite titles, Can Your Legs Tell Time? Uh, using Mass to Model Biology and Circadian Control of uh, Collagen. This was for our maths cohort last year for young people who wanted to get into maths as a future career. Uh, and this was put on uh, by a PhD student at the University of Manchester. We did this one for our physics cohort was how Einstein's work helps us to develop cheaper and more efficient solar panels. Uh, this was put on uh, by a lecturer from the University of Oxford. Uh, we did this one for uh, psychology. So anybody out there who's interested in psychology, it's 100% a STEM field. Uh, so don't feel like you just need to be in biology or biochem or et cetera. Psychology is definitely a STEM field as well. And we did uh, this lecture, which was moving through space, studying how architecture stimulates emotional experience and impacts navigation. Uh, and that was uh, put on uh, by Dr. Gregorius, um, who is in the Department of, the, of Experimental Psychology at UCL. Uh, we did using gen genomics to understand superbug outbreaks. That was for our biology cohort. Uh, and we also did cancer, a disease of DNA errors, which was for our medicine cohort. Uh, those were put on by the Wellcome Center uh, and Cambridge University, uh, uh, respectively. So you can see that not only are we doing interesting things across broad spectrums of STEM, uh, but it is world-class researchers, lecturers, uh, and educators from world-class universities who help put this program on with us. Uh, I'm going to breeze through a few of these. I'm going to put them up on the board just so you can see them, but I'm just going to kind of reiterate a few other things. Along the way, you're going to be learning about biology and chemistry or whatever field of study you might want to uh, get into. You're going to get um, uh, support uh, from lecturers and mentors, uh, which I haven't really mentioned yet, and I may not get to it, but uh, you'll have a mentor uh, from the field of study that you're interested in. So if you're interested in chemistry, we will find you a mentor who works in the chemistry field. Um, who can give you uh, uh, tips and advice about how to get into a chemistry career. But we also have workshops on personal statement writing, uh, career paths in artificial intelligence, if that's something you want to get into. Careers in various STEM fields, to be perfectly honest. Um, if you want information, uh, direct information about how to apply to Oxbridge or Russell Group um, uh, universities, we bring administrators on from those universities to give you firsthand guidance and advice about how to get into those schools or what you could look forward to by attending them. 
Uh, I've already mentioned we do apprenticeship programs uh, or we talk about apprenticeship programs and kind of the various options out there for you. We do job interview skills and CV writing. Uh, we do workshops by Roche and Abcam, which are two huge uh, global uh, pharmaceutical companies. So if you're into pharmaceuticals, uh, we are partnered with these two organizations. Uh, Abcam is in uh, Cambridge, I believe, and Roche is in Welling Garden City. Uh, and uh, they put on loads of different workshops for young people interested in not just um, um, pharmacology, uh, but in loads of different other useful skill sets that you might find useful in your future career. Uh, we do med school admissions, UK, UK CATS and BMATS, uh, and we, U, we do UCAS admissions and support and guidance. So we do a whole host of things beyond just the work experience, beyond just mentoring uh, in a kind of group setting. So our mentoring sessions work um, in a, usually have one mentor to about two or three young people uh, that will give you direct advice and you can ask questions of them uh, uh, that you may be afraid to ask in your school or that you may not know anybody uh, in that field who you can ask those questions to. We'll pair you up with uh, a real life uh, chemist or biologist or uh, mathematician to answer your questions and give you like the, the most specific feedback to what you want to do that we can that we can get. Along the way, we do competitions, uh, which people find fun. You get cash prizes um, uh, for photos, for videos, for blogs, uh, for loads of different competitions along the way, uh, just for fun. All of these pictures you see on this uh, slide right now are submissions uh, to our photo competitions um, in, in previous years. So you can see what other young people were doing at the time. Um, we'll skip the impact, although you can go to our website and look that up. Um, so just to reiterate, how do you get involved is kind of the last question that I know most people would want. You need to be a year 12 student. The program runs be in the summer between year 12 and year 13. Uh, so that'll be summer this year for most of you year 12s. Uh, we will offer virtual STEM lectures and in-person placements where possible, as, as, as well as virtual mentoring sessions. And some of those might be in person. Um, we're still kind of trying to work that out, uh, you know, as coronavirus will allow us. Uh, we do UCAS career workshops. STEM skill sessions, university admission support, competitions, publications, public speaking engagements. Uh, we cover the cost of your travel. So if we do do in-person placements and you need to travel from your home uh, to the laboratory or to the organization you're, you're partnered with, uh, we will help you cover those costs, okay? So we wanna make sure that it's basically completely free for you uh, to take part in uh, this program. Our applications are now open. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to say is by coming onto our program, you become a member of our Into Science UK alumni network, which is actually pretty huge. Uh, it's about 2,000 people now who have gone through our program before, uh, who are just like you, um, who now, uh, five years on, 10 years on, are in the professions that they were hoping to get into. Uh, and these are people that uh, you are connected with by being an Into Science UK alumni, which means We'll put on events, networking events, so you can go and talk to previous Into Science UK participants uh, and ask them questions. Maybe if you're trying to get uh, you know, your foot in the door at a certain organization and there's a former Into Science UK um, participant that's in that same organization already, they <coughs> might be able to give you a little bit of advice, <coughs> might be able to know who to suggest you uh, go talk to about your application and so on. Um, so it's a huge opportunity to, once you've gone through the program, you're a part of a broader family, and we support you even past this program. We'll support you in other programs. We have alumni programs for PhD students, for example. Uh, if you send us an email and say, uh, hi, I need help writing my personal statement, even after the program is over, uh, we will find somebody who can help you write your personal statement. Uh, so we are there 100% of the way, starting from your year 12 summer uh, until you are uh, graduated and in the career of your dreams in the future. Uh, so our applications are now open. They close on the 9th. Um, you can see the address there, uh, the web address there to our, to our applications. Uh, if you've got one of those QR scanners on your phone, you can probably just scan the QR code. Uh, and now, I'm sorry, I will literally put it right up to the very last minute. But if you guys have any further questions, I'll, I'll stick around and I'm happy to answer them for you. That's great. Thank you, Adam. It's such a good scheme. Is there any, are there any questions? You can either put them in the chat or or um, just put your mic on. Um, what are the chances? Of um, can you? But let's go with Nicholas. Let's go with Nicholas first, I think, and then um, I think there was someone else. So Nicholas, yeah, say your question. 
Um, what are the chances of being accepted into the program, seeming as a lot of people might be applying for it? Well, um, uh, the good news is the chances of getting into the program go up every year, partly because we expand the program every year. Uh, so just to give you a rough idea, last year we had uh, about, I think it was like 2,000, 2,500 applications across the UK. Uh, and then uh, we accepted uh, about 700 of those. Uh, so, it, you know, it's not quite, it's obviously not half. It's a little bit, it's a right around a quarter of those applications we accepted. Uh, but I will tell you that um, we uh, tend, the way we accept young people is based off a lot of different criteria. So first, uh, where you're located. Uh, so all of you are located in London, which obviously is the largest applicant pool, but we also have the largest openings in London. Um, so you kind of got a better opportunity uh, than say, let's say Exeter, where there are only 50 placements available, um, uh, but there might be 150 people who apply. Um, so I can't give you a good number on chances, but what I can say is that depending on the cohort you're in as well, makes a big difference about whether you get accepted on the program. The largest cohort or the largest applicant pool for us, much like that Oxford <clears throat> thing I was showing you earlier, is medicine. Everybody seems to want to get into medicine and not as many people want to get into psychology, for example. Uh, so I would say we probably accepted a higher proportion of our psychology students or our engineering students. Um, and I think I want to say mathematics is probably another high proportion uh, than our medicine students, just because so many people want to get into medicine. So not a straightforward answer. I'm sorry about that. But it's worth a go. It costs you nothing to apply. It costs you nothing to be on the program. It's completely free for you. Um, so, you know, apply and see how it goes. Am I right in thinking, Adam, they have to provide a, a, a teacher as a reference, don't they, on the application? Yes, you do. So as you're filling out your application, it will ask for a teacher reference. All we're asking is for their title, so Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. or whatever, uh, their first name and last name, and their email address. So you might just want to chat with your teachers first, find out who that's going to be, uh, and then make sure you've got that information ready when you begin to apply. So, yeah, so that would be your tutor um, students, unless there's a particular teacher that, you know, a science teacher. So we've got, um, actually, there was there was another student that wanted to ask something. You you clashed with Nicholas when you, you both spoke at the same time. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you to expand on the psychology part, um, because you yeah. mentioned that it was also a STEM subject. Um, and I also have, like, another question, which doesn't really mean much, but... Um, I I believe I applied for medicine. But I like I've already changed my mind. Like that's totally fine. First first of all, that happens yeah. all the time, so don't feel bad. Um, like uh, what what I would suggest there are a couple things you can do. Uh, we'll answer the second question first, then go back to the first question. Um, so a couple things you can do. You can just send us an email at students at into science uk uh, dot org. Which I, if I go to the next screen, that'll be up. I think for you there it is right there in the pink. Um, just send us an email uh, and just say just say what your name is um, and uh, that you would like to switch your subjects. Uh, but even if you didn't, uh, for all of you out there uh, who are about to apply, if you apply now, uh, we don't do the applications don't close till April. And I got to tell you, it is very common for young people to change their minds many times throughout the application process. When uh, applications close, we will select um, kind of a short list of young people that we will invite to interview. And then at the interview stage, um, we'll, we'll go over your application and say, right, so you applied for medicine. Is that still your first choice? And then you can still change it at that point. Uh, so don't feel like by filling out this application, you're locked in. You're definitely not. And we give you multiple opportunities along the way uh, to change your field of study, basically right up until the program launches. So the program will launch in the first week of August. And you have basically up until that point to go, oh, I don't want to do that thing. I want to do this other thing. And that's totally fine. Like we will just switch you over, put you in the like if you wanted to do math, we'll put you in the math cohort. And that's not a, that's not an issue whatsoever. Once you're accepted, you're accepted. Uh, we can suss out what your education, what, what, what field you want to focus on once we get closer to the launch. Now, the question about uh, psychology, uh, I wasn't quite sure what you wanted me to expound upon. Uh, but I will say that we 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 have a fairly healthy psychology cohort, uh, and we get uh, professors and uh, experts in uh, sci uh, various fields of psychology. Because, like anything like biology or math or anything else, uh, you could fracture psychology into 
to many different fields of study, even within that one umbrella. Uh, and so uh, if you were on our psychology cohort, you would have uh, multiple options of psychology lectures to, to attend virtually, of course. Uh, you would be given a mentor uh, who has a psychology background. Uh, they may not be exactly like in the same field of psychology. If you if you're like very niche and you're like one of those people who like I just I know exactly the type of psychology I want to do and that's it. it they, they they may not be a mentor in that particular field, uh, but they will have a psychology background. Uh, so can give you advice about uh, pretty much anything to do with psychology, probably even that niche field that you really want to know about. Did that answer that question for you or did, was there something more specific you were looking for? Yeah, that was great. Thank you. No worries. So, Adam, can I just ask, I mean, with the eligibility criteria, obviously students can go off and check that themselves, but how, how strict is that? So, you know, say if a, a student has got a parent that's been to university, because I think that possibly is one of the criteria. I mean, should, should they still give it a go or is that a definite no? <laughs> Yeah, well, okay, so the answer, the answer um, is obviously nuanced, um, and there are several different uh, kind of tick boxes for eligibility. Um, you only need to meet one of them. Uh, so um, if you have parents that have a higher a history of higher education, or don't actually is one of, is the criteria, um, then that's one of the, the boxes you can tick. Uh, but I will say it's probably worth your time to apply anyway, even if you don't feel like you meet the other eligibility criteria, because one of the criteria you uh, can check, uh, but you may not actually know off the top of your head. And that's what is called the Polar 4 uh, quintile uh, test. And what Polar 4 is, just to give you a bit of background, is it takes neighborhoods or regions uh, within uh, the UK and does a score based on the number of people from that area who go on to higher education. And then they rank order the, those regions in what they call quintiles, uh, quintile one being the lowest, meaning people from that area uh, don't often go on to university or higher education. And quintile five, meaning uh, a healthy proportion, probably the majority of the people from that neighborhood or what have you, um, go on to higher education. Uh, so there's a lot that goes into our eligibility beyond just the kind of tick box things. Um, so you may not even be aware that you live in an area like uh, one of those regions. Uh, and just from that can qualify you for the program. Great, thank you, Adam. But I do, I do think, yeah, definitely check out the eligibility criteria. You can see a few tips here about applying to our program. I will say this now, and I know it's gonna happen to some of you, double and triple check your email address, uh, because if I can't get a hold of you to tell you you're into the program, I can't accept you out of the program. So just make sure it's the right email address. Oftentimes what happens is the autofill, you're using the autofill function, uh, and if you share a computer in your household, it will give us somebody else's email address. Or, you know, the, the most common mistake is people will type uh, at gmail.com, uh, but they won't type .com. They, they, try, they, they type .con, you know, it's an N instead of an M. Um, and then we don't have an email address for you. So double check that. Double, double check that your name is correct. Autofill sometimes does funny things where it might be your parents' name you give us when you're meant to put your own name uh, and things like that. So just... Make sure as you're going along, try not to use autofill, double check your name and your email address. And that's really is the most important because if I can get a hold of you, we can correct anything else that's wrong with your application uh, so long as your email address is correct. So, um, well, I'm conscious of time, but we have got a few questions here which are quite easy to answer. So where do you apply? You've got the website there. Um, we've got a student here talking about traveling abroad in the summer. Well, obviously no one knows whether they can travel abroad in the summer. So my advice, I'm sure Adam's would be, is to apply anyway, because you don't know what's gonna happen. Um, yeah, and the one thing I'll, yeah. sorry, to, sorry to interject, the one thing I will also say about that is because it's a virtual program, if you do happen to travel, so it's it, the program runs over a full three weeks over the summer, but it does not require you to be like on the program every day from nine to five. Typically there'll be preset times so let's say we're going to do um, this like this huge biology lecture that's going to be really interesting and it'll run from like two to three on a Tuesday, right? So you might be free the rest of that Tuesday. Um, so if you do happen to be abroad or away, you've got a wedding or you've, uh, your, your, your sister has a baby and there's a whole thing that goes on, you know, a baby shower or whatever, um, there are lots of things that come up over the summer. Um, and we are trying to be flexible with you. So if you miss a day here and there, not a problem. Um, oftentimes 
we record the lectures for you uh, so that if you miss a lecture because you've got work, for example, which is all a big, a big reason why kids sometimes miss, uh, you can go back and watch the recording and catch up. Um, so there are ways around that. Uh, it just depends on how much time you plan on being away or how much time you plan on missing. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, how many weeks does it last? Well, I think you've just answered that. Is it three weeks? You just said. Yeah, three weeks. I believe yeah. it's August second through the twenty first. So I don't quote me on that, but I think those are those are the rough okay. weeks. Brilliant. And um, do we all start at the same time, or do we go at our own pace? You all start at the same time. Uh, the lectures and the mentoring sessions are live, um, and as I said, we record the lectures. We don't record the mentoring sessions. That's a key bit. Um, so you do want to make sure you're there for those. But the um, the, the lectures are live, but they're recorded. So um, if you can't make the live session, you can go back. Um, but otherwise, we'll do a big launch. So all the cohorts will begin, uh, depending on your subject. You'll all start at the same time, but you'll be siloed within your subjects. So if you're in the chemistry subject, you're not going to see what the physics kids are doing. Or you're not going to see what the psychology kids are doing uh, until the end of the program. Uh, at the end of the program, we open up the whole range of our recordings and we give you extra time, like I think it's like a month or two, to go through anything that we've done on the platform over the summer. So if you're one of those kids who's in the physics cohort, but you're interested to see what the chemistry cohort is doing, we'll open it up at the end and you can watch all the chemistry videos if you would like. Brilliant, thanks Adam. Um, I think, well, I mean, we're running out of, of time. I've got something else to go to at half, half four as well. But <laughs> if, I mean, if, no if students, if you think of any other questions at all, um, then just get in touch with me and I can check with Adam if I don't know the answer already. But um, so you've, you've got the website there, Into Science, um, all the information that you need is there. This is being obviously recorded and I will upload this onto the Careers YouTube channel, which is, um, if you want the details of that, it's in Get Ahead News that I send out to you every um, fortnight. Um, but other than that, thanks so much, Adam. Even if you do, Even if students don't, decide to apply for this or find they you know they are unsuccessful i mean i think everyone has gained so much from this presentation about options and really inspiring careers available in and stem so thanks ever so much for giving up your time again adam um absolutely my pleasure and it was a pleasure meeting all of you i look forward to welcoming you uh, who those of you who apply i look forward to welcoming you to the program uh, any questions do send them to the students at indescienceuk.org uh, i'm the one who monitors that inbox i'll be happy to respond to you as well Brilliant. Thanks, Adam. Lots and lots of thank yous coming in on the chat. <laughs> so right, should... Take care, everybody. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Thanks.